Justin McCorkle. Thanks very much for joining me. How are you? I'm well. It's a pleasure. Uh, so before we start, hit the record button. You mentioned that you are in a very good spot in your life right now because you absolutely love what you do. And I let that resonate. There's, there's a lot of people that want to be in your shoes that are currently are looking to, to move jobs, better their lives. Let's start with that. How did you get to where you are today? What was that journey like? Sure. Uh, that's a big journey, obviously. I mean, it's one thing to pull out a piece of it, uh, but collectively you could point to so many different things over the years that have kind of migrated my path. But currently I would say that the biggest impact in most recent times has been going through the book, 10 X is easier than two X Dan Sullivan and uh, Benjamin Hardy. If you're familiar with that text, uh, basically in that book, they talk a lot about trying to figure out what is uniquely you and then building your life and your career around that. Uh, so, I mean, the, the premise of the book, the question is, if you wanted to make twice as much as you make now, then you could work theoretically twice as hard. So that's your 2x. But if you wanted to make 10 times what you're making right now, you would have to do things radically different in order to pursue that path and to accomplish that goal. You'd have to start over. You'd have to redesign from scratch. So in 2023, I was reading that book and kind of built a process for myself to go through to try to figure out where in the world I should turn and make my next focus in life and career. And that it was just huge. It was huge to try to figure out what is uniquely me, where does my value lie? I had a lot of conversations with mentors and friends uh, because sometimes they see things in us that we don't see in ourselves. They can kind of tell you where you should be going, maybe with some more insight than you might be able to give to yourself. And Anyways, working through that process and identifying my unique contribution and where my strengths actually lie has uh, allowed me then, thankfully, I had the financial freedom to be able to step back and to say, well, then where should I turn all of my uh, interests and focus toward? What risk should I take next to try to lean into that? Because it is a huge risk. Whenever you're redesigning and you're saying, okay, I'm going a different route, uh, you could lose everything over it. And it's not the first time I have risked everything for an, for a venture, but I did. I, I turned and put my money toward, I'm going to pursue this path that best aligns with me. And then we'll see what happens. And so far, I'm very thankful, not only that I was able to do that, but for how it's going. So I can't tell you, even personally for myself, you know, how many times I have come across either self-help books or YouTube videos that tell you, Okay, this is the path you have to take. You got to do these three things and you got to do these five things and then you're going to better yourself 10x, 100x. And when I watch these or listen to these or read these, I like I nod my head and I get it and I understand. But somehow I have that difficulty and you're smiling because you know where I'm going with this. I have the difficulty implementing that to actually get from that theory to actualization. Talk to me about that. Like, how, why is it so difficult? Why can't we all be where you are today? Well, to use the illustration of the Matrix, right? I just watched this show the other day, so it's fresh on my mind anyways. Uh, but I believe that we are in something like a Matrix. Now, that doesn't mean that it's like a computer program or whatever else, but you're getting into like personal philosophy stuff. Um, I'm a Christian, and so I view everything through that spiritual lens that I have. And, it's fine that other people don't. It's not about that. Uh, but just the way that um, I view the world is that none of this is really long term. Uh, I mean, we're, we're all going to die. We're not going to be here long. And from my perspective, it's really not that real to begin with. It's more of a proving ground. So when you approach life as a video game, you know, imagine you're playing your own avatar. Like you are playing yourself in this game of life and you want to win. Now, what win is, is totally subjective. I don't think that there is a win that is universal, even though our society tries to tell us what the win is. The win is have this many millions of dollars, have this size of a house or this car or whatever else. I think that if we're not personally identifying what success is and really buying into this is what I want for my life, then we're not going to know what win is regardless. But once you get that honed in, you're like, I know what I want for my life. Then you're just playing a game and you may not win. That's the truth. You may not win the game. You may lose. You may, uh, you may fail, just like when you're playing a video game. Uh, but 
you still want to play. I mean, no one picks up the controller to play a video game. It's like, I'm going to play it super safe and not take any risk, you know. Uh, you know, it'd be like picking up Grand Theft Auto, right? And I'm going to obey the traffic laws and I'm going to turn and, and just... If you want to play that game, you got to know the rules to that game. And then you got to go and win in that game. And you're going to strike out sometimes. We're going to fail. And everybody talks about the importance of failure nowadays. I think it's a really great thing that we're doing, having these conversations in the business community even about the importance of failure. Uh, so why not just play it like a video game and go and fail, go and struggle, go and have a hard time. Just know why you're doing it. It gives it meaning. Then. And if you use the same kind of concept you know with video games you have more than one live you know you can hit reset and you can do it over and over again it's really frustrating when you when there's no you have to start from the previous you know previous screen or previous level you have to go through it again Shit. Sure. in life how do we make sure that we balance it out hey you know like just you know play to win and also use all our tools to our disposal. We'll not take, you know, play it safe because we definitely want to win, but also know that we only have this one life. We don't, we can't reset. We can't go back to the previous level and start again. Or maybe we can't talk to me about that. Well, to make it a little philosophical, I mean, Descartes, he spoke about how you can't really reset. You can't be who you were. You learn, you have new experiences. So in a sense, every time we have a setback in career or life or whatever, we aren't actually starting over. Even if financially it looks like we are, our bank account is back to where it was when we were you know, 21 years old because we've just lost everything or something. You have so much more knowledge and perspective. You're not the same person that you were at 21. Uh, it's like the person who begins to climb a mountain isn't the same person who completes that journey. I mean, it's, a, it, it's so much growth that happens during those things. So. I was asking a group of uh, business leaders here just recently, would you rather start over back where you were when you were younger with a little more money in the bank or lose everything right now and start over financially? And universally, they were like, well, I'd rather lose all of my money and start over right now because they learned so much about how the world actually works, how money works, that it's a no no brainer and let's start over from where we are because the wisdom that we've gained the experiences that we gained the relationships that we have are all so much more advanced than they were just even a few years ago that this is the time to start over so if you were ever going to lose anything you're ever going to lose it all this is the time to do it as opposed to any former time of your life so you're not starting over so that's uh, anyways i'm you have to understand that my risk profile is very skewed. I'm too much of a risk taker. I'll tell you that it's cost me a lot of times. Uh, I don't balance that always really well, but thankfully I have a wife who's extremely risk averse and it helps to balance things uh, somewhat. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've lost things. I've lost it all and will probably do that again at some point in my life and just go back to it and build it again. And it's different this time and it grows exponentially faster. And talk to me about what it is that you do today and how do you help your clients to get better? Because part of your journey to become better and more fulfilled in your role, you're also in that journey helping clients to be better in business. Talk to me about that process and what it takes to, you know, maybe like just the first initial conversation you have with a potential client, what it is you look for you are essentially a problem solver, right? You help them solve their issues or solve their problems, whether it's business or personal life. Talk to me about that process. Sure. All right. So I work with executive teams and I help them to set strategy and accomplish strategy. So it's more about them and their journey than it is me, certainly. And what I'm coming in to do is to help them get on the same page and to figure out not only what they want for their organization, uh, but also what they want certainly with regard to the end goal, what impact they want to make on the world, what they want to do financially, what kind of culture they want to have in the organization, all those types of things. So uh, sometimes we say it like get strategy done. It's a way to figure out not only what strategy you want, but how to actually accomplish those goals. So I meet with my clients after initial kickoff, we meet quarterly. And every quarter I come back to kind of see how they've done with the objectives that were set for the 90 days. And then 
figure out what went wrong, if anything went wrong, and if what went right, how can we double down on that? And then we look forward. And so this is all in line of longer, longer term goals. And so we're able to, to kind of build a path to the long term goals through those 90 day increments that are in place. So uh, I'm a system and soul coach, which is essentially a business operating system that allows for growth, both on the system side, getting better systems in place, as well as the soul side, that's what we use to refer to culture and uh, culture development and growth. We also, I also work with the leadership team to help them individually grow as leaders. And from your experience, what are the kind of the categories where, where these executives need help? Is it more on the strategy side, the implementation side? Is it personal or is it, as you mentioned, part of the culture? Well, maybe it's all of the above. What is it? Do you see any trends that you can say, okay, this is repetitive regardless of the industry? Yes. I would say that most of the time where they think they need the most help or where the initial pain is, is around objectives and completing objectives. Uh, usually in you know, my sales process or whatever is to identify, have you been able to meet the objectives you set for your team over the last few years? And the answer with my clients usually is no, we've had a really hard time accomplishing our objectives. So that's the initial thing. It's more on the system side, right? We we're trying to find better systems to accomplishing our goals. But I would say that longer term, the actual need is deeper than that. It ends up being more culturally, it's more leadership development, it's more just trying to to figure out identity, who we want to be as an organization, identifying our onlyness statement, all of those types of things. Uh, but that stuff is less tangible. So it's not the initial way in the door usually. Usually it's, we can't accomplish our objectives. Okay, well then let's work with the team and figure out how to do that. By the way, uh, what's it look like in the organization? What is the culture like? And how can we actually become an organization people want to work for and clients want to do business with and have long-term relationships and all that good stuff. And how do you distill those issues? Meaning that, you know, let's say you sit down with an executive and they, basically provide the whole overview of what, what's wrong and what they want to achieve. And then out of that, you have to dissect it and, you know, bring it down to bite-sized pieces where you, you can address. Uh, and then maybe there's, there's, you know, best bang for the buck, or maybe there's some certain things to changes they, relatively minute changes that can make, you know, create a large impact. How do you, in your mind, while you're doing these, these you know, these conversations, these uh, discovery questions or discovery conversations, how do you distill that into bite-sized sections and how do you then take that and apply, you know, maybe a strategy or a next step or provide guidance in terms of where to go? It doesn't happen all at once, as you are alluding to. It's one of those things that we have to take the priorities first, figure out where we're going and where we need to go. But I'll say one of the key pieces is not just sitting down with an executive or the CEO or the founder or whatever and saying, where do you want to go? Okay, let's plot a path to take the organization there. I think really a key thing is to stop being a founder led company. If you want to move to the next stage of your growth and development, we need to become a team led organization. So when we're trying to build out cultural values, we're really trying to identify what those already are and put them into a framework that everybody respects without them being aspirational or something so that it doesn't hold water to the organization. It starts with that full executive team and figuring out who they actually are and building core values around that so that when they come out with these values to the organization, it's not a hypocrisy thing, it's, it's realistic. It's, oh yeah, these people really do stand for these things and then Distilling that through the organization takes time. It's all of the things that you do to reward people. It's kind of like if we say, oh, yeah, we're all about serving the client, but we're handing out bonuses and rewards and gift cards to people that just close the biggest sale. And that's it. That's all we reward is close the biggest sale. And it doesn't matter how it turned out. It doesn't matter if that um, client ends up being really an unhappy client or we weren't able to fully deliver. We're just closing, uh, closing deals and then rewarding people that close big deals. Well, you're actually saying what your value is through your actions. The, the value is we want to close deals at all costs. But if instead we are 
giving shout outs to people that are upholding our four values. Hey, you told that client what they really needed to hear because that's right. That's how it should be done. And they ended up being really unhappy about it and didn't close the deal. Well, we still want to reward you for having said that this is the way it really should be done. And you know, just finding ways to reward upholding a different set of core values than just we're all about the revenue. And once you do that, you transform the organization because we learn so much through assimilation, right? It's like I watch you get rewarded for something, for standing for some principle, uh, for saying the truth when it was hard uh, for whatever it is. Uh, and then you get a reward for that. You get a pat on the back. You get called out uh, in front of the team. And what I learn is, okay, if I want to succeed in this organization, then I need to be doing that. So you build values long term through living out those values and rewarding people who live out those values. And Justin, are there any times where you have to have difficult conversations with clients? Meaning you hear something that is glaringly obvious that it's wrong or not wrong, maybe just something that they're not doing right. And it's a difficult proposition to to especially telling an executive that maybe was successful up to this point to tell them that they're not doing the right thing. And maybe some stories behind it, because people remember that. Sure. I think that peer accountability, considering that I'm working with executive teams, is really the place where that kind of growth is going to happen. And I view myself more as facilitating those conversations uh, because we're trying to build shared values, shared vision, right? Uh, I'm trying to help the team have a common language, common purpose, all of those things. So I would say that a lot of times pulling out the elephant in the room is sufficient to have those conversations in, in those settings. So I'll give you an example here just very recently. Uh, I was with a client and we were doing a two-day session as part of their onboarding uh, and we were working through a number of issues, but, and we worked through all that stuff just fine, but I noticed a couple of comments throughout the couple of days that were bringing to light a pain between sales and delivery in this particular client environment. I don't want to get too specific with it, but there was obviously some tension between a leader of delivery and a leader of sales because they were not on the same page and just an, through just enough little things that were said and then immediately kind of pushed away. Uh, and so before we closed out the second day, we had time that I had carved out to deal with opportunities and obstacles that were there. And so I said, we've had a great couple of days, team. Now I'm going to try to ruin it for us. Uh, <laughs> just um, We've got some things we need to talk about. And so just bringing those to light. This is what I heard during the course of the couple of days, and it hasn't been addressed what can we do to start figuring out how to make everybody happy with this? And so that just opened a conversation. And initially the temperature goes up, right? I mean, the heart rate goes up, people are defensive, people have some things to say. So you're purposely stirring the pot a little bit, but you keep a safe framework on that where here are our rules for these conversations uh, and then let them kind of have their say. Everybody gets to speak. You don't let People speak over one another and all of that, but you're facilitating a productive conversation. And then we start as a team thinking about solutions. What can we do to get on the same page about this? And as those others then get involved, there's able to be some peace that's brought to it because now we start understanding that, look, we're all going to have to make some compromises, but why are we making compromises? What is the goal? Where are we trying to get to? And after about say 30 minutes of conversation around this difficult issue, um, they were able to come to a place where both sides of that conversation felt pretty good. Okay, we have a plan. I appreciate that there's support here. Other people are jumping in to say, how can we alleviate some of the pressure uh, between these two divisions in the company? And it, I think that, uh, it, and it came out in our 90 day objectives. Here are some things that we can do over the next 90 days to make sure that this is a change that's taking place. And uh, anyways, very productive. And that's one of those things that you would think when we step back and we say, oh, well, these are adults. These are highly successful individuals. They're making tremendous amounts of money. So I think that we tend to think money equates. They know how to do everything. They know how to figure everything out. But in the, in the end, we're all just people. And people in groups have conflict sometimes, and they have to have good conflict resolution to work through those things. And bringing that out 
and having a safe place with rules in place to help guide those conversations is tremendously valuable. And how do you make sure that, you know, you, you do the two days in a session and, you know, people come out of it maybe energized and ready to, to make things better, you know, for the next 90 days. And then I always say that people are just a little bit of like rubber bands. We need that you kind of pull the rubber band. They're like all into what you just said. And then three days later, they get you smiling because you know what, what I'm saying is partially true. They're coming back to their original methodologies, you know, Buddhist operandi, the way they, they always worked and they always behave and they always, you know, uh, were doing things. How do you make sure that? your kind of legacy of those two days continues on for the next 90 days and creates a more safe fact. There's several great answers to that question. Uh, the first is weekly meetings on the, these topics. Uh, so when we set 90 day objectives, um, we are, um, we're doing more than just saying, Hey, over the next 90 days, y'all go do this. Um, we are actually, setting up a framework for this is how that's going to look over the next 90 days with 30 and 60 day deliverables. And then you have a weekly meeting to make sure those things are on track. So everybody that has a part to play in this, they have ownership over their particular thing. So in that process, they're going to be giving an update every week to the full team. So the team is on a set time with a call going through an agenda every week. Where is this at? So they have peer accountability again. So it's just a framework for them to operate through to make sure that the things they said they were going to do are actually getting accomplished. And if they're off track, then it's the time to say, hey, why is this off track? And then how can we help to get it back on track so that we meet those 30 and 60 day and then 90 day goals for those things. And then when we're, gonna, we're gonna come back in the room in 90 days, right? And then we're gonna say, hey, here were all of the things that we said we were going to do. Were they all done? And if they weren't done, then why not? And that level of accountability in the organization where it's not to rough anybody up, it's so that we all are working toward the same things. We see how your 90 day objective fit within the whole. Now we all know that we're doing this for us and we all built together our vision of where we want to go, where we're going. So it's not just something that's being thrown down at me from on high, right? The founder said he wants this done. Uh, and so I just have to slave through and do it really, I was part of this conversation, part of this vision to decide where we want to go. Now I know my part is to accomplish this. So all of it kind of comes together to create a, an environment and a culture where there's accountability, there's clarity and accountability, and then we have each other's support to try to get those things done. So when you take organizational behavior in a MBA, you know, two year program, they always tell you that, you know, people are resistant to change. They're, you know, they, they're just, you know, partially already answered the accountability piece, but is there a time where maybe people get exposed, meaning that throughout those 90 days or through that process, you find out there's, there are people that are maybe not purposely, they just don't, they're not a good fit for the organization. Maybe they're, you know, something that they operate with, or maybe their, their core beliefs and are not you know, not aligned with the company. How do you yes. deal with that? That's going to self-resolve uh, one way or another, right? Either those individuals will leave. Justin, I like how you're politically correct, self-resolve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those people will leave or they will be removed from their positions, right? Uh, that's, that comes with clarity. Uh, we want everybody to know exactly what they're responsible for. We want them to, to know when they're winning. Uh, one of the things that happens right now, I think on the other side of that, when there's a lack of clarity, is this constant anxiety. Am I doing a good job? Am I pleasing my superiors? Does my team think that I'm doing a good job? So we beat ourselves up. We have all this internal anxiety. Am I living up to some standard? But we can't know because there's no clarity on what actually is, is taking place. So for us, we're wandering into then the annual review or whatever, and we don't know for sure how we've been doing. But isn't it in the corporate speak, there's all these KPIs 
you KPIs know. are actually a really good thing when they're used well, because then I'm able to know. But so much of it is politicized at this point to where it's intangible things that aren't on the KPIs that we're actually getting judged for. So one thing that you know, I try to do with the clients is to build really clear KPIs. I say this, that- Give they, me, if you don't mind, give me an example for that, because what you said is super important. You know, just give me an example of what that looks like in, in the yeah. real world. All right, so imagine you're playing a football game you want to be able to look up at the scoreboard knowing you're winning, right? I know that if I'm playing football, I'm down here in the South, okay, Texas, it's football. Uh, if I'm playing a football game, then I know, first of all, how to win. We've got to get the ball, then we've got to take it, we've got to make a touchdown, we've got to kick a field goal, whatever, it's how I get points. And then I can look up at the scoreboard and see what is the score, am I winning or not? And there should be enough clarity in each role that every team member should be able to look at their job description and know if they're winning or not. So maybe someone outperforms and then that person, we might be saying, well, we really, really want to promote them or whatever else, but for a person to actually hold down their seat, are they winning? So the KPIs may be like, let me take any role you want to, even the, down to the janitor, we should have KPIs for the janitor. You're going to check on uh, the restrooms Every day, you're going to clean the restrooms, this number of restrooms. Every day, you're going to go into, on weekly, you're going to need to mop, uh, not mop, uh, wax these floors in this area of the building. If we build out a strong enough KPI, we can then have an employee that looks to all of their list of responsibilities, and they're going to know if I'm doing my job or not. Did I accomplish all of the things that were laid down? If the answer is yes, and that person also shares our core values in the organization, whatever those core values may be that we've designed. If they share our core values, they live those core values, and they're accomplishing all the things for their roles, then they're solid. They should not be concerned about their job. They shouldn't have any of that anxiety. Uh, and when we lack that in an organization, you've got people that never know if they're doing well or not. And that's, that's not a good place for anyone to be. None of us want to live in that space. It sounds like almost an anti-quiet quitting if you... Uh, if you you come across this, this term where people essentially instead of quitting their jobs, they're doing the bare minimum to get by, but this would, maybe we don't care how they're doing, obviously, because they, you know, they're just, they don't, they're fed up from their organization. Um, talk to me about what's happening now in the industry. It seems like the economy is, is on a trajectory and not a positive one. And a lot of organizations are under a lot of pressure to perform and also to still maintain, you know, a great uh, customer relationship, still, you know, identify the goals and reach those goals from a revenue perspective. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the executives to also perform. How does that, in your opinion, make an impact on, on organizational change and, and do they have time? It seems like sometimes they're so focused on the end result, which is revenue, to leave the kind of the lights on and everything else is being set aside. Like, you know, the culture, like the what you strategy, like all they care about is let's meet the, the revenue for next month. The best organizations financially at this point are investing heavily in their culture and in their people. There are very few exceptions to that the groups that are outperforming the market are putting their people first because where yeah. are your top performers going? They're going to organizations where they feel supported, where they feel like they have a purpose, they know what they're supposed to be doing and they can, they can do those things. There is tremendous opportunity at this point in society financially to actually put people first. The ironic thing is, is that when you have outside forces telling you that, oh, it's all about the financial goals that you have to meet. Like that's the number one thing uh, that they're probably gonna end up in a pretty bad financial spot uh, long-term. It's just not gonna work out. The goal of leadership has to be to also understand where the market is for people right now. And if you want the best people, you, you wanna become a great company. You know, Jim Collins, uh, good to great, uh, famous, famous business book. I mean, he was pointing this out uh, a while back and, and doing studies of businesses that spanned over decades and found these same things over and over again, even outside of what people might term as the modern movement or whatever. Uh, even before that, this has been true. 
if you want great teams, you need great people. If you want great teams and great people, then you need to have clarity and good goals and purpose and all of those types of things. So I would say that you can't really have the financial gains that you want long term without understanding what the reality is. We're all organizations. It doesn't matter what type of organization you're talking about, from nonprofits to for-profits to public companies to private companies. What it, we're people all getting together, working together. And if we're not showing people that we value them, they will leave. And that doesn't just come out financially. That's only one way that we value someone. It's only one component they're viewing when they think, do I love my job? You know, you've heard it before. You, I'm sure you've seen many people that are like, I make a ton of money and I hate my job. They'll stay until they can't stay anymore. What does that mean in actuality, putting your people first? Like, how does that manifest itself in a... Because, I, and I have to tell you, a lot of companies also say that. They, they claim they do. It's in, their, it's in their mission statement and the company brochures. And, but then when you come in and it's a disaster and people are like, they hate each other and they hate their, their roles, even though it's, it's it plasters everywhere in the company uh, booklets. How do you, in actuality, do that? Yeah, that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, of living core values. Keep the thing, whatever you want to say. You can say whatever you're, you think you're supposed to say about what your core values are, but everybody around you knows the truth. If you come out and you say, my core value is uh, uh, you know, putting people first, and then they look at the organization and they see that, well, the only people that really get uh, praised around here are the people that are bringing in revenue and it doesn't really matter where that revenue comes from or what happens with that relationship or client uh, people see through that if if you are building a toxic environment you can say about it whatever you want to say your employees figure it out and they get out so it's it's definitely a thing that can be not true you know what i ask clients is what do you want your employees to say about you on glass door it's not, but, I mean, those reviews are great. If you can get on Glassdoor and read what, and I try to do this with my clients, I, try, I go onto Glassdoor and see if I can read what former employees say about the organization. And that's sometimes the bucket of cold water because you'll have founder or whatever. And, oh yeah, we have a great organization. This, and one thing you hear all the time is, oh, we're a family environment. Or, uh, like, and then you read what people have to say about it. And it's not that, <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, it's uh, one of those things where it's shocking. Uh, and, and then, you know, you can think on the other side that, oh, this isn't actually, uh, but isn't it, maybe we should take it as a, you know, on the flip side of that, you know, if you get laid off, you know, you're disgruntled and of course you're going to say bad things about the company. Um, might be other reasoning why, you know, maybe some even, I don't know. Maybe they move to a competitor. Maybe, a co you know, who knows? There's, I think reviews, like, you know, if you look at any type of reviews, there's, yes, so I guess the aggregation of those is probably mm -hmm. some, you know, yes. median line, but so you can definitely tell. Mm -hmm. But there might be some, some outliers somewhere that there are. You hit, you hit it right on. It's the, it's the culmination. It's the uh, average of what's being said. There are always going to be outliers. There are going to be people that, for instance, just don't share the core values of the organization. Uh, they might not be honest people. They might not be hardworking people or whatever else. And so they're going to have some things to say on their way out when they have been found out, uh, whether they self-selected their removal or were removed or layoffs do happen. I mean, that's, that's the truth. How they happen matters a ton, which is a separate conversation. But uh, yes, it does happen. But there's this organization and uh, it's based out of Dallas, but it's a large organization, over a thousand employees. And they had to do some layoffs here in the last year. Not a ton, but they had to do some layoffs because a particular revenue stream had just dried up with the economy. You know how technology has been lately. Uh, so they did some layoffs. And so I went and actually read some of the things that were being said about them uh, through that because they have this reputation of being a company with a great culture. Uh, they care about their people. I know several of the founders of this uh, organization and I respect them. So I wanted to see what does it actually look like uh, from within to these people. And what I found was really awesome. 
uh, from a you know from a perspective like mine, where I'm trying to see uh, if they're living this out, were employees lamenting that they had been laid off because they loved working at this company? Uh, I mean, they the um, they didn't even have a ton to say about the layoffs because they recognized that they weren't working because the stream had had dried up and their job they were doing software development primarily and. There wasn't revenue in software development, and the company kept them on for a while, even with no work, and then got rid of them. I'm not saying it was all roses, but overall, the consensus was that it sucks because we want to work for them. I enjoyed my job. I enjoyed my managers, and, uh, and you know, this went the way that it did. So I, I think it's a, a misnomer that people are always going to hate your organization if they go through something like a layoff or they get fired or whatever. It is not the case. People initially have the emotional reactions that they have. But when they get on something like Glassdoor and they leave reviews, you can read those reviews and see why they feel the way that they did. If you've got someone who's really upset that they're no longer with your company, that's probably a good sign that you're doing the right things. Uh, it is very possible. Again, it takes a lot of work. It takes time. But it's getting clarity on who you are, what you're trying to accomplish. Is it about more than your exit or how many millions of dollars you profited over the last year? Is there some purpose behind it? And when you can get all of those things ingrained and get that throughout the organization and people are treated well, they walk away wishing they were still there. And if you look at the history, I think at some point in time, there was loyalty, both from, from the employee and the employers. And then we moved into, you know, the gig economy. It seems like the fastest growing jobs uh, sections are the part-time jobs. And then people have multiple jobs and they, they, you know, they have to be loyal to multiple companies. With that trend, considering that trend is going to continue, whether we are going to be talking about it here or not, what can the employers do to still have that relationship? still distill that that culture with with their their teams despite the fact that they they may be working in another job or they know for a fact that they're on a contract base so they're only going to be here for three months and then move on human dignity is an important component of all of our relationships giving that dignity to one another uh, and People are more than their job. As far as the gig economy and all of that goes, I think it's actually a really good thing for the market as a whole. Your top performers have the option of going and starting their own thing more easily now than at any point in human history. Uh, it is very easy to set up an LLC. It is easy to, uh, to message, get out in front of people, right? And talk to them about what you can do for them. And that puts a great pressure on the market. Uh, we have an economy right now that is in a lot rougher shape than the Federal Reserve is pretending. Uh, you alluded to the growth of part-time jobs. Uh, that's the only growth that we're seeing in jobs. This is, of course, being recorded in May of uh, 2024. Uh, but for the last several quarters, you're not seeing an increase in full-time jobs. So they keep dropping these jobs reports telling us that, oh, everything's great. Look how great everything is. Look at all the jobs being created. And then you dig into that and actually see what jobs are being created. There is stagnation in our full-time jobs. There's an increase in part-time jobs. So you have uh, a couple of things happening with that. But one of those things is the gig economy because of inflation. People are just trying to, to survive and they're doing what they can. So it's a, a good thing that we have the ability to go out and take on some side work if we need to provide for our families. As long as it doesn't compete with our full-time job and we're able to bear that, sometimes we just need to do things to get through. And any executives or whatever that don't understand that, uh, it's because maybe they're a little out of touch with the reality of the situation. Uh, you know, all this inflation that we've been dealing with in every area of the last few years, you're talking about accumulated 30% uh, plus increase on regular prices for people to live. And if that means nothing to you, it's probably because you have so much disposable money. But for people that are trying to survive, that's a huge impact. It's, it's a hard thing to bear with children and all those types of things. So from that standpoint, you just do what you have to do. People always have done what they've had to do to survive, and we always will, especially in America, we're innovative people. 
Um, but then on the other side of that, the gig economy attraction to your top performers, maybe people that are not top performers are desperate for jobs and are having to apply to jobs for months to try to get a role when they've been fired or laid off or whatever else. But your top performers have more options than ever. That means if you want to keep top performers, you better be investing in your, your organization culturally. You better be doing what you can to make those people's lives good in more ways than just money. Maybe you can't afford on the bottom line to give some crazy uh, pay increase to someone, but you can do a lot more to make their life beneficial in other ways. Uh, so there's just other areas of compensation uh, that you can be trying to, to give people support in. So from my perspective, it's a market like anything else, right? What does competition do when it comes to any gadget, any software out there? It makes it better. It drives us to be better. And I would say the same thing is true with the employment base. We had the great resignation that happened, and that caused companies to say, what can we do to actually get people to want to stay? The market shifted. That's no longer taking place, but you still have that available for top performers. So we better be thinking, how do we make this a place where your top performers want to come and be a part with? And speaking of getting better, how do you, throughout that process of consulting, we talked about the kind of the initial... Uh, the ongoing, at what point in time you know your job is done or maybe it's never done, and how do you make sure that you're continuously improving, meaning that maybe towards the the end goal, you know, do you set up yet another, not a goal, because you can always get better. Well, you've got two sides to that. I think is from some things like a revenue standpoint, we're mostly always trying to grow, right? I do think that there's space for different conversation. I mean, there was not long ago, I was talking with a, uh, a principal in a, an investment firm and they were talking about moving into this new revenue stream. And the question became, well, why, why do you want to do that? They had easy lives. Uh, they were comfortable. They were worried about causing new stress to try to move into a new area. And, and it was all of course to increase revenue. But then uh, my question was, well, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to increase revenue? Uh, maybe it's not the thing that you want. Now, if it is, then great, let's figure out a way to do it. But I think that that honest questioning and answering is important uh, because sometimes if we're being real, we don't want the headache that comes with growth, trying to expand into a new area or whatever else. Now, maybe we do. Maybe it's because we want to accomplish something else. Uh, we want to give this much money to charity or whatever. There, you'd be surprised how many businesses actually have charitable goals as a percentage of their income. They're trying to achieve greater income as a, a way to give more. Uh, but, you know, the question that you're, you're asking is how do you know what's next? Well, part of it is you're asking those questions, what do you actually want? Uh, and, and then secondly, there's two areas of what's next. There's what's next for the business. And then there's what's next for our executive team. We want to become better leaders, right? So maybe the focus needs to turn to how do I become a better leader? Here's, here's books that we can read together. Here's workshops that we can do together to try to advance those skills and to see those holes in ourselves that we weren't recognizing, hold that mirror up uh, and say, oh, wow, I didn't really realize I've been doing this. So I think there's this constant growth journey. I, I don't personally think there's such thing as a business expert or a culture expert or whatever. I mean, leadership experts. Uh, that sounds as though you, you figure this out. It's like, Oh, it's, it's math, right? I did the formula, I got the answer, and I'm done. Uh, but it's not that. It's, this is human growth we're talking about. Uh, how do we become better than where we are? And it doesn't matter where you are. There's always an answer to that question. As long as we're alive, we have room to grow and improve. And I think that we should be striving for that. So sometimes it's about enabling that development. How do we become a better organization? Maybe it's not a revenue focus this year. We Say we want to just hold to where we are, but we want to become cleaner. We want to become more profitable. We want to become uh, better stewards in whatever area that might be. You've got organizations uh, that, are, that are devoted to becoming uh, greener. You've got some that are devoted to doing more charitable work or whatever uh, and helping them to not only figure out what that is, but how to get there. There's always room for progress. Is there a particular stage of a company, of a growth company where this type of process is better fit or is it, are they customers or potential clients where you tell them, listen, you're not ready 
for me to come in or maybe the other way is, you know, is true as well. Maybe a company that's super advanced and maybe like you, you can't really add so much value to them. Where's kind of the perfect alignment between what you offer and the company journey? Sure. I think that that's one of those things where they have to, to figure out the answer to that. I'm more interested in clearly communicating uh, how we would work together and then they can decide for themselves that that's valuable. But there is obviously a profile. We all have our ideal clients. Or whatever. Um, usually the companies that I work with are either, first of all, they're trying to become team led instead of founder led. So maybe they're doing 10, 20 million in revenue, but it's all been built on the back of the founder. So their culture is about what the founder wanted it to be. And a lot of times they're detached from it, which is another conversation. Um, maybe it's uh, their core values have only been determined by the founder. Maybe the founder has been the one saying, here are our revenue goals. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. Here's what our mission is and all that kind of stuff. But they've gotten to such a point of complexity where that no longer really gets the buy-in that they want it to. Uh, it's, it's time. It also becomes a prison for the founder. They did this most of the time. Founders, the profile typically is that they're freedom people. I mean, they want their personal freedom. They were doing, they built this business from scratch. They took big bets, big risks early on to build a business so that they could get this life that they wanted. And then they have grown and grown until it's a prison now. They're trapped. They can't get away. They can't break away. They, they're always tied into their business and they want to become now team led. They've got a group of senior leaders and it's time to start making this something different so that they're just a part of it instead of the one calling all the shots. The second uh, is high growth stage. They are growing so quickly that they have to figure out how to stay ahead of their, their issues, their communication problems, their people problems uh, before it eats them up. Uh, so recently I was talking with a group, uh, private equity funded a startup and they are tearing it up. Uh, and they, they already have around 50 employees and expect to double within the next six to eight months. Uh, that type of growth is really difficult to manage. And you're not going to probably successfully do that uh, without having some outside perspective regularly kind of coming in to level set with everyone and, and to make sure everyone's staying on the same page. Uh, so those are the two typical um, profiles that I would see. Um, typically, my clients, uh, you know, working with me is not, it's not pennies on the dollars. I mean, it, there's good return, but it's not cheap. So typically, they're doing at least 10 million in revenue. Most of my clients are doing more than that. Um, but also, though, a lot of the times um, they've gotten to such a different type of organizational stage that usually when they're over around 150, 200 million in revenue, uh, they're no longer um, necessarily wanting to work with someone like me who's dropping in on them. Not always the case, but that's typically how that works. Uh, so, yeah, if I was answering the question on a revenue side, I'd say 10 million to 150 million is what my clients typically look like. Organizationally, it's usually over 25 employees up to a few hundred employees. Uh, just because that's where those spaces that I just described really kind of mostly lie. Um, after that, it becomes a little different at the beast. And Justin, if somebody listens to this right now and they don't fall within that category you just described what can you provide them in the next few minutes like tips and insights to to get better and maybe you know you know how they can do a like an mba and and they said tell you a two-hour mba why don't you give me like a like a, a quick nutshell of what potential improvement can you get from taking these two or three steps in the organization if you don't fall within the category? Okay. Uh, I'm going to answer this in a weird way, I think, uh, because it's probably not what you're looking for. Uh, Tim Spiker, famous author, great, uh, great writings that he has. One of the things he, he talks about are the most valuable components of leadership. Um, he, he writes about these studies that were done to try to figure out what was uh, most important to be a great leader. And they identified all of these attributes, 10 or 12 attributes from looking at thousands of, of excellent leaders. And then they found that out of all of those attributes, just two of them made up 77% of the effectiveness of great leaders. And those two were um, not what people would often think, not organizational abilities or charisma or whatever else. It was being inwardly sound and others focused. 
So if we want our organizations to be better, if you're a leader in one of these organizations, I don't care if it's a startup and it's you and one other person, or if it is a uh, multinational corporation with tens of thousands of employees, ultimately you've got to start with yourself. Inwardly soundness is huge and getting inwardly soundness doesn't happen with a snap of a finger. And sadly, most of us think we're a lot more inwardly sound than we actually are. Uh, so getting some outside perspective on your individual journey, your life, having great mentors and people that will be real with you when going through work on yourself to say, wow, I really have a gaping hole over here that this has just been brought to light for me. And now I need to figure out how to address that. That's going to go so far into making your organization better. And then the next piece, uh, others focused. Too many people, myself included, at different stages of my life, have been so focused on being others focused that we neglected that first piece of inward soundness. But that doesn't work. It, it falls apart at some point. Uh, you can't handle it. You can't bear what you're supposed to be doing and at least all types of shame and, uh, and pride. Uh, so that's it's not going to not going to work out. So I just would say start with the inward soundness. But then as you start thinking about others, um, everybody else is, is a human just like we are, that human dignity piece. It doesn't matter what their station in life, how much money they make, what position they have in the organization. They're all human beings. And once we start seeing others as holding great value, then the organizations that we're trying to build should bring them all dignity. Uh, everyone should get respect and kindness from us. Everyone should have clarity in their roles. Everyone should be able to know when they're winning and when they're not winning. Uh, everyone should be treated well with respect and kindness. And when we're doing those things, we're going to make our organizations better. So clarity and all this executive strategy and stuff that I do working with these teams is, is tremendous. But unless we are focused on being inwardly sound and others focused, it'll all end up flopping. Uh, so I would just say that carries into every single organization. Um, so, yeah, that's it's not really... The answer, I think, that probably people would want to hear, uh, how do I build a great organization? Oh, well, put this in place and have this structure and you'll make millions of dollars or whatever. Um, it's better just to say, focus on being a really good human being and then focus on helping other people be good human beings. Then you can learn all the business stuff. That, that's, that's just systems. That's just things that we need to do as good habits to build revenue and having the right product market fit and all that kind of stuff. But that stuff is all tremendously easier than actually growing as a human being. But that's, that's my take on that. And you're right, it wasn't what I was expecting, but it was very profound and I thank you for that. It was, it was a great answer. Um, we're running out of time. I'd like to, before we leave, what is the easiest way for people to reach out to you, to know more, maybe to, to inquire about uh, consulting, engagement and whatnot? Uh, email me, Justin at leanleadersinc.com, uh, L-E-A-N, leadersinc.com, um, and be happy to have a discussion. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, I just hope that we're all able to figure out what we want our life to be and go out and pursue it with boldness because you only get one shot. Uh, this is it for us here on this earth. And uh, there's so much to do. There's so much to see. We can't possibly... Uh, accomplish all the things that we could ever dream up but what we can do is to to lead good lives and to treat people well and to make our little small part of the world better so if i can help you in any way with that i'm happy to and if not i wish you blessings on your game justin very impactful it was a phenomenal conversation i really appreciate you taking the time to join me today and looking forward to seeing you all in the next episode and until then stay safe online as well offline and i'll see you the next episode of unscripted thank you again Thank you. Thanks, Justin.